Voilà. Avec grand plaisir, j'accueille, je vous en prie, voilà, le père euh, Georges, qui est le recteur de l'Université Saint-Esprit au Liban. Je profite, euh, non, alors je, je voudrais le remercier d'abord d'avoir accepté de nous faire cette introduction. Je voulais également vous dire que nous sommes en discussion avec le Père Georges pour que l'année prochaine, nous puissions peut-être vous proposer à vous, recteur, vice-recteur, une retraite spirituelle. Voilà, la spiritualité n'est peut-être pas toujours honorée, elle est honorée dans vos vies, je n'en doute pas, mais au niveau collectif dans la, dans la FIUC, et donc nous y avons déjà réfléchi, nous en discutons, et sans doute que vous aurez une proposition vers septembre-octobre prochain. Voilà. Merci beaucoup Merci de votre présence et de votre intervention. Good morning to everybody of you. I warmly greet your resilience and courage. The topic I'll tackle to this morning is Catholic University, diversity or diversity, and integral education. Honorable audience, what I find appropriate to propose under the heading Catholic University, diversity, uh, university, diversity and integral, integral education embraces a set of multidisciplinary ideas that could serve as a roadmap among an infinite number of possible roadmaps. The only objective in this case, the way in which we should educate our young people to a plural and integral modus vivendi, joyfully harmonious in the assumed and assimilated difference. Pentecost, this great Christian feast, festival, could help religiously train our young people to the dialogue of cultures in their differences. The term Pentecost comes from Greek word Pentecoste, meaning the 50th. That's the 50th day after Easter. The Arabic and usual term in our liturgies in Lebanon and the Orient, Al-Ansara, comes from the Hebrew Atsura, meaning gathering, assembling, and reuniting. In other words, the counter image of the linguistic and cultural dispersion symbolically illustrated by the Tower of Babel. The biblical saga of chapter 11 of Genesis tells us that mankind spoke only one language and that people communicated with each other with ease. As the human being is the eternal dissatisfied and constantly tempted to go beyond his abilities in a senseless impulse of self-deification. The Babylonians embark on the adventure of the Prometheanism. Renowned as the great builders, they decided to build a city and tower whose top penetrates the heavens symbolizing the greatness of man and his superpower. Far from God, and even more, without God. Knowing their design, Yahweh severely punished them by confusing the components of their language and dispersing them from there on the whole face of the earth. Thus, from one people, They became peoples and nations. And instead of speaking one language, they began to speak many, like us. As a result, they no longer understood each other. Their relations have become conflicting and managed by animosity and mutual rejection. It will be necessary, mandatory, to wait for the event of Pentecost to bring a true panacea to this tragic history of the incommunicability of the human beings. As can be seen, in Pentecost, 
almost all the peoples of the Mediterranean basin in their most pronounced irreconcilable particularities accept and understand each other with the help of the Spirit of God in the assumed and respected difference. As you well know, St. Peter spoke Aramaic and all the peoples of the Mediterranean basin understood him in their own mother tongue. According to this new perspective, all languages and cultures are equal. And consequently, none of them can claim to be the sole repository of any sacredness or truth. Thus, thanks to the Spirit of God, which harmoniously brings together diversities, no culture, no language, no civilizations, having been marginalized or dismissed. Linguistic and cultural sacredness is entirely foreign to the essence of the message of the New Testament. All the productions of the mind of man, wherever he may be, whoever he may be, are equal to the fact that they reveal the diversity of the image of God reflected partially by the human intelligence. With Christianity, cultural authority deserts the conflicting register of deculturation and linguistic standardization and enter the new era of true dialogue of civilizations for a pluralist approach to reality. It is within this framework that the joyful astonishment of the Mediterranean peoples, as recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, is firmly inscribed in the following passage. How is it that each of us understands them in his maternal idiom? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, inhabitants of the Mesopotamia, Judea, and Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and that part of Libya, which is close to Cyrene, Romans in residence, both the Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them publish in our language the marvels of God. End of quotation. With Pentecost as the major contribution of Christianity to the dialogue of cultures and the peaceful management of pluralism, there is also an equally essential component in the evangelical message. This is the New Jerusalem. All the apostles was, were bitterly disappointed with Jerusalem, the city whose etymological meaning refers to the city of peace, Urshalayim, city of peace, has absolutely never seen any day of peace. Its borders until now, moreover, are broadening or narrowing according to the balance of forces engaged in both defense and offensive. Earthly Jerusalem is a, is a space of culture, religious, and civilizational divisions. While the new Jerusalem, preached by Christianity, still in the spirit of the Pentecost, rests mainly on three fundamental dimensions. In the first place, it is no longer a prisoner of the sacredness of its geographical borders. Its space is coextensive with the extent of the salvation experienced by humanity cured of its impulses of violence, violence and death and death in peace dispensed by the union with the intimate life of God. Secondly, it's a freedom from its monoculture, a perfect illustration of anti-culture and sacred ostracism. And third, it is the city where all religions and cultural identities are reconciled in mutual acceptance and differential complementarity made possible by the unifying spirit of God. 
our students could draw from all the above that any project of uniformity and reductive integration for specificities and differences inevitably destroys the essential framework of human existence. This sociocultural and political danger is strongly emphasized by Alfred Simon in his articles, The Mask of Violence, about René Girard's book, Violence and the Sacred. I quote him, it is the loss of the difference between impure or reciprocal violence and the purifying violence that brings about a general crisis of differences, starting from the cultural order as a whole, since it's an organized set of differences on which the harmony and balance of the community depend. In order to understand it, one must grasp the undifferentiations as violence, which modern thought does not do, which being egalitarian in, in, in its principle, sees indifference an obstacle to harmony between men." End of quotation. It is nevertheless useful to point out that the changes in our societies today produced by media coverage and technological progress are not tangential. The miniaturization and condensation of our world necessarily involve all human phenomena, whether religious, cultural, or civilizational, the old insularities disappear, caught, but caught up by the irreversible flow of globalization. How for integral education and starting, in this case, from religious, societal, anthropological, and genetic considerations, should the Catholic University lead its students to accept themselves in the joy of being different and together. Is this a global village? Our students will realize that the exacerbation of murderous, murderous identities will be an unavoidable deadline in this week, how to be and be with. How do we manage the human resources in their discordant diversities and lead them to accept themselves as relays of human experiences that are unique and indispensable for a pluralist approach to multidimensional reality? Without the other, in what it is and by what it is, could I have existed? Without the other, without the non-self, could I have become aware of my own identity? Besides, is not this non-self, the foreigner, at the very basis of my otherness in the indivisible whole of the body of mankind? When I seek to standardize, is when I seek to standardize or to marginalize or to eliminate this other, this dissimilar opposite, who constantly challenges me and shakes me positively in what I take for eternal evidence, would it not be a slow, unconscious self-destruction and consequently a lethal neutralization of the cognitive and exploratory faculties of human intelligence, including my own? This observation is fully integrated into what Charles Taylor calls the policy of difference in his book, The Politics of Recognition in Multiculturalism, Difference and Democracy. Taylor points out that before the late 18th century, no one thought that the differences between human beings had this kind of moral significance. There is a certain way of being human. That's my way. I am called upon to live my life in this way and not in imitation of anyone else's life. End of quotation. From the above, Taylor concludes what he finds fit to call, to call here, excuse me, the principle of originality. Each of us, comments Marie Guy, in her book, The Citizen, each of us is unique and has something to say that no other can say. In a democratic society, the government recognizing the equality of everyone 
must give all the same opportunities to develop its authentic self. End of quotation. These different analyses could lead our students to note that the first victim in these complex societal changes would be rootedness and consequently identity resilience. It's nonetheless, nonetheless evident that the basic belongings of a human being presenting themselves as the first foundation in the construction of identity are not the result of an act of will. Who would have chosen his father, his mother, his country, his language, his culture, and even originally his religion? The Germans are right to define the human being by design, the being there. Indeed, one is surprised to be placed in special temporal coordinates for the choice of which one has nothing to do with it. Perhaps one considers this kind of involuntary routing as a stifling constraint for the freedom of the individual. But what do you want is the only possible mode of existence for man. How can we have the chance to exist otherwise? The predefined ontological equation presents itself as an obligatory passage. It's from this anchoring in pre-existing existential data that paradoxically the human person is called to realize himself freely. Like the unconscious in the human being in the first three years of his life, which is formed in a gradual and victorial way, so does basic routing. The unconscious developing independently of the person and gaining in depth in the obscure meanders of the first cognitive mechanism determines later our free and conscious behavior. Likewise, the involuntary basic belonging intensely colors all the harmonics of our later life at the very heart of the most frenzied transhumans. This inter intertwining of basic belongings reminds me of the famous fragment of Heraclitus of Ephesus, which Hegel used to establish his conception of the dialectic and power of the negative and the victorial march of history towards happy positivity, where he says in full, the contrary is on contrary, on the contrary. The most beautiful harmony that of the opposing things. That being said, our students might well ask why we are so dedicated to, to defending the principle of assimilated and understood diversity. When we defend coherent pluralism, we defend wealth, freedom, and life. The biggest danger we face in today's globalization is indeed lethal, and deadly standardization. The formatting of the spirits now produced by a kind of monoculture on international scale inevitably destroys the momentum of life, innovation, and imagination. Uniformity, whatever it may be, cancels freedom for the simple reason that the freedom can only be exercised in multiple choices. And consequently, monoculture can only lead to gradual atrophy and asphyxiation of thought. The philosophical principle that one must be ourself to be with others could preside over all the educational strategies of our students in order to save cultural diversity and consequently to promote an integral citizenship stamped by the coordinate spatiotemporal and dynamic systems. As everyone knows, the construction of identity is neither linear nor stagnant. It is the result of a process of enormous complexity where so many endogenous and exogenous factors come into play. Hence, the need to develop immune systems in our youth against the drying 
and deadly cultural standardization. In counterpoint, in a corpse, what would be? Yeah. It will be obvious to our educated people that diversity is the only fabric of existence, and therefore the only way to go to real life and peace. Undifferentiation is an act of violence, contradicting the regulating principles of life in society. If one were to refer to the living body, one would perceive that no cell is like the other, that no organ is similar to the other, but they are all in a functional cohesion. In counterpoint, in a corpse, what would be the difference between all the biological constituents? Any. Death makes differences disappear and plunges everything into a macabre immobility. Life has no existence but diversity. And apart from diversity, it is the funeral procession of the life and creativity. At this point, it would be good for our students to return to ancient Greek history, where the Hellenes have developed two diametrically opposed formulas to manage their city. Sparta always sought the cohesion and fusion of its people into one group, so it drove out all strangers, leaving only the pure Spartans in the city. It established an oligarchic military regime feared by all. On the other side, Athens illustrated an opposite image. It enjoyed a democratic regime thanks to the genius of Pericles, its doors being open to all lovers of knowledge and the search for the absolute. Its schools were diverse and free. During the Peloponnesian War, Sparta won the military victory, and it was the defeat for Athens, a cosmopolitan and democratic city. Nevertheless, who still remembers the military glories of Sparta? It's blind racism and its hollow pride in maintaining the purity of its race and blood and the uniqueness of its religion. This sterile inheritance of Sparta was entrusted to the forgetfulness of history. On the other hand, Athens, defeated militarily, remained an escapable pole of culture philosophy, theology, science, literature, theater, and politics. Its immense contribution to the patrimony of humanity made it a greater victor in the history. If our students, on the other hand, read the current scientific publications on genetics, they will be shocked and stunned at the secrets of our human nat nature. The eminent researcher, S. East, and specialist in population genetics, Albert Jacquard, explains in his book, What's Heredity? Introduction to Biology. How genetic recipes are transmitted while pointing out that pa parents' reflexes are de de deployed in an attempt to transmit to their child everything they possess. Possess in terms of genetic heritage and family memory. Still, genetics, Jacquard tells us, teach us that it can only be an illusion. We pass on to those who generate half of the biological recipes we received at the time of our conception, without the adventure that we experience at our substructs. The only reasonable ambition is to contribute to the realization of the new whole, all the more astonishing as it's unexpected. Every one of us is unique. Building on the different contributions of Christianity, philosophy, anthropology, and genetics, the university, a Catholic university, could be allowed to attest that the rejection of the other dissimilar and the consideration of the other as hell will not be not, not at all, 
ever intractable. Similarly, the university, a breeding ground for rising generations, could be intimately, intimately convinced that the human world will necessarily pass beyond its failure and will be entirely established in its function as an escapable means of communication between rational men and inhabited by the same passion for the happiness to go together towards a city where humanity finally become dialogical and reconciled with itself in the harmony of opposites will eventually live the civilization of love and peace. Thanks a lot for your listening.